I'm not used to speaking to people, only one-on-one, -on -one, and this is very unusual for me. But I do feel that I need to speak about my past, especially after coming back from the March of the Living. And there aren't many of us left, and so I'm a survivor. And because I survived, I feel I have to tell the story. Uh, I was born in December of 1935. Um, I lived a normal life, what I thought was in Vilna, Poland. It, actually, not Vilna, it was Miagel, a small village outside of Vilna, uh, which is now Belarusia. Um, the, my mother and father were uh, well-to-do people. My mother came from Vilna. Her father was a rabbi, and he, uh, they lived there. And my father came from Miagel, and he brought my mother back to Miagel to, to live. And my father was a very charitable person. He helped anyone that needed help. And those are the people that later on helped us. Um, I had two, two brothers, uh, an older brother, Harold, and a younger brother, Norman. And we, uh, when the war broke out, we were not invaded until 1942. And I tell you all that I know, and I'm not sure that I remember it as I remember it or as I, my mother and father told me. And so, just bear with me. Uh, when the war broke out and we were invaded, we all had to wear, we had to be identified with Jewish stars, or we had to have an armband, and you could not walk outside unless you had the the star, the yellow star on you, or the armband. Uh, we stayed there for a while, and then uh, they decided that they were going to put all the Jewish people on one street, and they called that a ghetto. <coughs> Um, my father saw the writing on the wall, and he, uh, he left us to try and find a place for us to stay, or to hide, I should say. Uh, in the meantime, they were taking the people, the Jewish men, they would take them every day, and they would say that they're taking them to work. And one day, they took them to work, and it's hard to describe this, but I, I think you probably have read articles and, and have seen <coughs> stories. They took the people and they massacred them. They had thrown hot water on them. They had the German police dogs bite at them, they randomly shot at them, but before they did all that, they had them all dig a huge hole. And then, after they shot at them, those that were still able to stand, they had them pull all the, the injured and the dead people all into this huge hole. And I don't remember where or how it was. All I remember is pulling on my mother's skirt, saying, I want to see, I want to see, because they were looking out the window and pulling on their hair and screaming because my two uncles, and we thought my father was there too. Uh, that was the, uh, really my first introduction to what was coming. That, that night, my father came.
came to get us. He came into the ghetto and he got us out of out of there and he thought that he would uh, stop at our house to get some clothing for us. And when we went into our house, the Germans must have known that we were there or someone told them we were there, but they came after us. And by then they were all celebrating. They were, they were drunk and they, they marched us back to, to uh, the ghetto. And actually what they did, they, they were shooting with a bayonet and, and a rifle and they shot at my father and he fell to the ground and the German, uh, the SS kind of pushed him over with his boot because he was in the way or pushed his arm over because he was in, they were in the way and we continued going and my father was shot in his ear and the blood was gushing out and so they thought he was dead but after we left he got up and he ran away and waited until late late that night and he came back to the ghetto and got us out now you have to remember that the ghetto was not like, it was in the very beginning, so it wasn't, it didn't have the barbed wire, they, it was still, we were just on one street. And when we left there, we went to a, uh, a friend of my father's to their home. And we stayed there I don't, can't tell how long we stayed there, but I know that they couldn't keep us. So then we went and stayed in other people's homes. And again, they couldn't keep us. And the Germans announced that if you are keeping Jews, you will be punished as well. And so then we escaped, we went into the forest and the forest was, it's hard to describe the, the Polish forest. I think if you've seen the movie Defiance, you will understand how thick the forest was and all the marsh that was there. And in fact, it was the very same forest that we hid out, not with the Defiance family, the, we were in another part of the forest. It was a huge, huge forest. It was uh, 20 kilometers, maybe more, maybe 50 kilometers. I, I, I don't know, but it was huge. We, we then went into uh, this friends of my father's, who uh, his name was Alexander, and we stayed in his basement and the basement was not really like a basement that you would think it was just dirt trampled down dirt we had a um, a, a huge plank of wood and blankets and we stayed on those blankets and we stayed there day and night and the the basement had a little window and my father would always go up to the window and he would read us from the Bible he would read us Bible stories it was every day and during the night my father would go outside and go from village to village to people that he knew and ask for food because the people of this Alexander, they didn't have enough food to feed themselves, no less to feed us. Uh, every now and then we would have a bath there, 
but we, we mainly stayed in that basement. And then one day, Miss Alexander's sister came to him and she said, Alexander, I heard you were keeping Jewish people. And he says, no, no, I'm not. And so she believed him. And she came back the next day and she says, you're, you're hiding this from me. I heard you were keeping Jewish people and I will bring the SS tomorrow to check your house out. So when she left, he came down and told my father that we had to leave. But he went with my father, with his horse, into these woods, back into these woods, and he helped my father dig a cave-like condition in the woods. Uh, it was, I, I don't know how to describe it, it was not very big. It was uh, maybe the size of three mattresses. And we stayed there. He covered the outside with brush. And the dirt and the sand that they dug <coughs> out, they bagged him and they dragged him over to uh, a little stream or so no one would know that we were there or that there was digging going on there. Um, we stayed there for I think a year and a half. We stayed there summer and winter. Uh, all we had was the food that my father would get and there was like a loaf of bread sometimes and he would we would cut it and and we would that's that's what we ate water maybe sometimes a bottle of milk um, and my father would as he would go to these different people's homes uh, they would give him this one man said to my father I saw your sister and where did he see my sister he says take me to her take me to her uh, he took, my, my father went to, found, he found his sister sitting at the end of a forest with her daughter, who was younger than I was. And she told him that they had paid this man a lot of money, all the money that they had, to walk back to deeper into Russia to escape from the Germans. And there were a lot of people and they were walking at night through the forest. And my aunt said that it was very difficult to walk with the children and she had to carry her. And a lot of the parents, in order to save their children, would tie them to a tree and leave them there, hoping that somebody would save them. My aunt said she just couldn't, she, she couldn't do it. She said we would both have to die and she just stayed back. But my father brought them, the two of them back to where we were in that cave and they stayed with us for the rest of the time. It, it was it was terrible. Scared. I, I just don't know how to. For entertainment, we would take up, take off our clothes during the day, and clean off the lice and shake them out. Those were the conditions that we were in. I mean, it was it was, it was just just terrible. And one day, when my father was at this man's house. He heard on the radio that the Germans were retreating. They were losing the war and they were marching back. But before they marched back, they, they burnt everything inside. They killed everything that they saw, horses and cows and 
and they were going to go through the forest to kill any, they knew that there were a lot of people in the forest. And they couldn't go in there with their tanks. So they formed what the Germans called a tip. It's actually a braid, the translation, but the, the different meaning was they were lined up in a row, marching through the forest with bayonets and rifles and killing everything in sight. And my father knew we were not going to survive where we were, so he decided that maybe he would divide us into three groups and maybe one of us would survive. And so he took my mother and my younger brother and he put them in a haystack and he told them to stay there and not move until he comes back to tell them. If they survive, if we survive, then he would get them. Not to move, not to make a sound. Then he took my aunt and her daughter, my cousin, and put them into another haystack near a, a mountain. He found one. And he couldn't find a third haystack. And so he found a pile of brush and he took one of the blankets that we had with us and he laid it out and we laid on top of it, my brother and I laid on top of it and covered us with a lot of brush. And I remember he taught my brother how to whistle. So when he went out to check on my, my mother or my aunt, he would find, be able to find his way back and so he, that's how he learned how to whistle. He, uh, he came back and we laid there and I remember being so dry and so thirsty that he took a spoon and went into the, the ground, a little bit of, of kind of mud, I would say, and we kind of wet our, our, our lips with it. And we laid there, and we laid there, and we laid there, and then we heard some motion. And my father kind of whispered to us that I think they're getting close. And that had to have been from where that my mother survived because we didn't hear any shots. And they got closer and closer, and I could see boots of the, the, the soldier coming towards me and then we heard a command and it said Einschließen rechts means everybody turned to the left and so the soldier that was coming right at me omitted me to the left and the next one omitted us and they, w they went by. I can only say that it's it's a command from God that did that. It couldn't, be, it couldn't have been anything else. And so one of the soldiers, as they turn, says, Wiener der Vermorgen, weiter in die Wälder, weiter in die Sunken. And I can't forget those words. I remember them when I sleep at night. It means as soon as the morning comes, <coughs> Again, we're in the forest. Again, we're in the marsh. In other words, they didn't want to do this either. Some of them, they were soldiers, and they had to do what they were told to do. Uh, we laid there, and we laid there, and then maybe an hour, maybe even longer, and then my father kind of got out, and he went and he checked on my mother and they were okay. He, but my father said, just stay there until I come back. Then he went to check on my aunt and she, she couldn't believe that my father was there. 
He says, yep, they were here, they were here. They took some grass or, or hay from the haystack and then they went on. So then my father, it was a, right near a mountain or a mound, I don't know what it was, but he kind of went up and looked around and he saw a lot of fires burning and he, he didn't see the Germans anymore. And so he kind of went back towards the village. There was a huge uh, road there and he saw other people and they said, the tanks are coming, the tanks are coming, the Russian, the army's coming. And with that, he turned around and he ran and got all of us. And you have to picture this, we're all running towards the road, towards the tanks. No longer hungry, no longer cold, barefoot. And we're watching the tanks go by. And I remember seeing a soldier jumping down from the tank and taking off his hat and putting it on my younger brother's head. He, he recognized that we were Jewish. I mean, we were skin and bones and yellow. And we stayed there and uh, we tried to go back, I think it was to our house which was occupied at the time. And so he found a house uh, that was empty. Uh, and we stayed in that house. And we stayed there for some time. And my father became well known in, in our village because he was a pretty smart man. And one day they came to him and they said, Hendela, his name was Hendel, and they said, Hendela, the cows are all dying. He says, can you help us? Can you help us? And so being a smart man, he went and he looked at them. It was a very hot day. He turned on the hose and he hosed the cows down and he gave them a lot of water to drink. and. By the end of the week, they all were, they were fine. And then he also helped them get um, sap out of the trees, which they used for, I don't know what they used it, but he became very important. And this Alexander said to him, Hendela, don't stay here. Don't stay here, he says. The Russians aren't any better than the Germans are. And he said, don't stay here. And my father said, well, I'm not going to leave until I, till I get my sister. His other sister was also with, the two sisters were together that marched back into to Russia. And when they marched back, they were all, from what my father learned, is that they were all in a, in a work camp a kalhoz, they called it. And he got papers so they would be able to not stop him, that he was very important. And with those papers, I don't know how, but he found my aunt. He also stopped, he was in, in Moscow, where my mother had a sister. And I don't know how he found her. But he did, and he wanted her to come with him too. And she said she couldn't leave because her son was married to someone related to Stalin, and they would all be killed if she left. So he went on and he got my, my aunt. And when my aunt saw him, she says, Hendele, what are you doing here? What are you doing? They're gonna keep you too. And he says, no, they won't. The, he showed him the papers and he said, if you're gonna keep me, you're gonna have to answer to these people. You're gonna end up in jail. And so he, I guess, was afraid and he, he left my aunt go. Now, when my aunt came back, 
My father put us all on a wagon and he was taking us to put us on a train. I don't know where, how smart he was. I just, single-handedly, he kept us all together and all alive. And not only did he have to hide from the Germans during the war, but also hide from the partisans. Because the partisans needed all the men. And here, he couldn't, he couldn't leave he, all of us. He had to take care of us. And now, he was trying to take us, take us back, and he didn't know where he was taking us. But he stopped on the horse to say goodbye to Alexander, the man that helped us. And Alexander really didn't want us, didn't want anyone to know that he helped us. Because the people were not for those that helped the Jews. The Jews. So we left there, and then he put us on a cattle cart train. And he took along with him bottles of vodka and cigarettes. And every time we stopped, he directed it to go to, uh, to Germany because he knew that that's where all the Jews were. And eventually, they were all going to go to Israel. And so, he would get out every time the train would stop and have the <coughs> train directed to go <coughs> towards, towards Berlin is really where we ended up. And he would give them a, a carton of cigarettes or he would give them a bottle of uh, vodka and they would do it. And <coughs> when we got to Berlin, we were on the Russian side. And then we got to the French, then we got to the, the, and eventually we got to the American side. And when we got to the American side in Berlin, my father said, we're not gonna stay here. And he took us to Munich, Munich it was called. And when we got there, they had DP camps. DP is displaced people that someone just told me about their family living there. And in the displaced people were all people like, like us. People that survived the war, people that came from the concentration camps. Everybody there had a story. And the DP camp was like a, there were barracks like um, like Indian Town Gap. Those are the type of barracks that we lived in. And they had Israeli teachers there who made up a school and we went to school there. And they had barbed wire around the DP camps so the Germans could not, the German could not vandalize the, the place. And I remember going to take lessons, piano lessons, from a German teacher because we had a piano at the school and there was a bicycle there and I was on the bicycle going to Volkertshausen, which was the very next village from our DP camp and the little German soldiers, not German kids, throwing stones at me and saying, Verfluchte Jude. That was taught to them at home by their parents. Everybody knew about the Jews, and so whatever you hear, people saying, we didn't know about it, we didn't hear about it, we didn't know this was happening, not so. Not so. It, they all knew what was happening. Uh, anyway, uh, we tried to, to go to Israel. We were learning Hebrew, and we couldn't actually go directly to Israel because, uh, I don't know if you saw the movie Exodus, before the, the English would not allow 
the Jewish people because Israel was not a state yet. We didn't get to uh, Germany until 1945, 44 and the 44 of 1945. And Israel did not become a state until 1947, 48. Uh, and so my father said, I didn't save my family from Hitler to lose them in Cyprus. We had to go by way of Cyprus. And then the Haganah would take the people into Israel. And so he was looking for places for us to go. He applied to go to Australia, Canada, many places. But uh, my mother remembered that she had a cousin <coughs> that lived in America, in Binghamton, New York. And this cousin was uh, David Schwab. And his family lived with my mother's family in Vilna until their father called for them. And so she, they went to school together and, and, and there was her cousin David Schwab and she remembers writing letters to that family. And when they migrated to America, they even took one of my mother's sisters along with them. And uh, she didn't like it there and so she left and she went to Israel. Uh, my father and mother wrote a postcard to Binghamton David Schwab, Binghamton YMCA, because they no longer had an address, and never thought that they would ever hear from them. But eventually, we got a letter. This this postcard came to the YMCA and the Schwabs were no longer living there but there was one brother that remained and they asked him did he know a David Schwab and he said oh that's my brother and he sent this post postcard to him he lived at the time in Baltimore Maryland and uh, he saw the postcard was from Rivka and he knew that was his cousin. And he went to Washington and prepared papers for us. And that's, that's how we got here. I remember him coming to uh, New York to pick us up and taking us to, uh, actually to Harrisburg from New York. Uh, his sister lived in Harrisburg and Anna Kleiman, and so we stayed with her uh, a couple weeks, and I remember not being able to, it was six weeks before school was out, they took us to register us for school, and I spoke no English, and David Schwab's wife was going to Williamsport, to visit her mother and she came by to see us and when she came by to see us she wanted to know if I wanted to go along with her for the ride well she had to say no more I was already <laughs> packed and she spoke no, no Yiddish and I spoke no English but there I went with her to Williamsport and in Williamsport she lived across the street from a family who had the mother spoke somewhat Yiddish and she visited with her mother while I was there with this family and the children were all playing hide-and-seek well you don't have to speak English to play hide-and-seek you're going to finish counting you, you come out and so uh, uh, this Rachel Schwab came back and she says she was ready to leave now. And I didn't want to go. <laughs> I, I was having a good time. And she says, no, no, you tell, she told the mother to tell me that I'm to go with her, but when she comes back, I can stay there. Well, that was fine with me. So I went on to Binghamton to see another cousin. Uh, and after that, I came back to Williamsport and there was 
one of the, the, the girls was my age and I stayed with them for six weeks. Six weeks like the man who came to dinner and never left. <laughs> <laughs> and I learned how to speak English. It's either sink or swim, and so I learned how to speak English. Uh, when I came back, I went into eighth grade, and uh, I spoke English to to everybody. Uh, to this day, my older brother has uh, an accent, and I have very little, I guess, or none. <laughs> Some. I, I feel it. I, I don't usually speak in front of people because I oh, feel, I guess, self-conscious of it. My knees are a little wobbly. I guess you can tell that. My voice is a little no, shaky. Doing very well. I'm, I'm doing the best I can. Um, the, the life, I guess, has so many turns so many ways. Uh, when I was in high school, I became very active into everything. Uh, the, the gym teacher chose me to be in the band front. I didn't know how to twirl a baton or a flag or whatever, but she said, you'll learn. She liked the way I marched, so. <laughs> and I would fit in their uniform, I guess. So that's how she chose me. And so, uh, then I got into high school and I continued on with that and not only did I do the band front but I was in everything that there was possible. I was in the, the, every team, baseball team and volleyball team and soccer team and tennis, tennis and, and uh, there was an organization called Seminar and they chose 10 girls from each class to be in that. and. They ran all the intramural sports, and uh, I, I just loved it. There were a lot of write-ups about me in the, in the paper there. And um, in my senior year, I met my husband, uh, who took me to my senior prom. He had just come back from the service, and uh, I was married shortly thereafter I started business school and I put my finger in the door so I couldn't continue typing and, and shorthand so uh, my husband said to me well then let's just get married <laughs> and so we did we got married I had three wonderful children Sandy Deanie and Steve were here uh, and uh, lo and behold he got sick and he passed away. My son was a senior in high school at the time. And I think, um, th I think about three and a half years later, I met up with this man's, this David Schwab's son, who also lost his wife. I guess it was just meant to be that it was beshert in Yiddish, you, you say it. I always felt that Eddie, my first husband, sent him to me. Mm -hmm. And we were married for 23 years. And he recently passed away about five years ago that he's gone. Um, I don't know what else. If there are any questions, I'll open it up. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. My parents, that's a very good question. How did my, I, I left so much out that uh, my parents, when they came here, went to night school. Uh, they, DNH gave them a job, uh, David Schwab, they gave him a job at DNH. He was a janitor. And then he, uh, started a little army and navy store and then he got a bigger store and he went to my mother and father both they went to night school to learn how to read and write in English 
and we all became citizens. In fact, my naturalization paper is there mm -hmm. all the way on the left you can, as you walk by. We all became citizens at the same time. They were wonderful. My parents gave their life to the family, to the children. Yes? Whatever happened to the people that took care of you? This Alexander? See, I left all that out. Uh, it's a very, very good question. I have to answer that. She asked, whatever happened to Alexander? Uh, after we were here, I was very active in the Jewish community here in Harrisburg, but my brother lived in Carlisle, and he was very active in the Carlisle community. And uh, he, uh, I don't know how to explain it, but uh, there's a war college there, and every country sends a student from their country and Israel does the same thing. They send a worthy student from Israel to uh, the United States to study. And uh, they always looked up my brother's name. And they ne he never had to advertise it. Each, to each one, as they would go back to, their, to Israel, would give Harold Swidler's name to them and they would call him before they came here. And they would, uh, they became his family and my family. And uh, he became so friendly with them that uh, they, they it would invite him to, to their, um, I guess their affairs that were going on right in the war college. And right after the Iron Curtain was lifted, there was the family there from Belarus. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother met him, and he said, um, why don't you go back to the country where you came from? There are a lot of changes now. He says, last year, if somebody would say to me uh, that I would be having dinner with Jewish people, I would never have believed it. But here I am. And so he made arrangements for my brother and my sister-in-law to go there. And they did. And they <coughs> met them at the airport with a big name, Swidler. And they took them to our village, to Miyajo. But nothing looked familiar. So then uh, there was a Miyajo and a Yena Miyajo. Uh, uh, there were two Miyajos. And so when they went to the second Miyajo, he, he realized that that is where he was two years older than I was. And so he remembered a lot more than I did. And he, uh, he said, um, nothing looks familiar to him. And he saw a little old lady walking and he still spoke the language. He went over there with a babushka, and he said to her, any Jids here? It means any Jews. She says, yeah, there is one. And she showed him where he lives. And this man's name was Monis. And when Harold knocked on the door, he, he knew who Monis, Monis knew who Harold was. He says, I remember playing with you. You were just a little boy. And he says, uh, took him around, he showed him the cemetery where all, everybody was buried, and he showed him where uh, we lived, where, where at the time was already um, occupied. It was actually was torn down, and a new building was built there. And uh, he, he saw everything there was to see, but he didn't see everything, so he couldn't keep the, the family there any longer, so they left. He had uh, toured around, and they came home, and the following year, he said to me, he says, I, I really didn't see everything. He says, I have to go back. I have to go back, he says. I have to 
see if maybe somebody would remember my father. And so he and Eileen went back, and this monist met them, and he and uh, this monist were driving through the woods, and he says, uh, maybe some of the old timers would remember my father. And as they were driving through the woods, this monist saw this young man with boots and a, a, a knitted cap, and he stopped to see him. And my brother says, oh, he's too young now. He would not remember my father. He says, it's OK. He says, but I know this man, and maybe he could take us to somebody that would remember my father or your father. And so he stopped, and he's talking to him in Russian. And he's telling him who this this man's father, this man's father's name is Hendele, and he used to live in Yajo. And and do you know anybody that would remember or we could talk to? And he says, Now wait a minute. He says, Hendele. I know the name Hendele. He says, I I I know this Hendele. So my brother says, how could he know Hendele? He says, he's too young. He says, well, he wants money. He wants something. He wants some recognition. And he says, no, no. He says, I know all about Hendele. If you don't believe me, I'm going to take you to see my wife's father. Mm -hmm. Now, mind you, the wife's father, all these years, we never talked about anything. Nothing to my parents. Now my parents are gone. And the only name we remember is Alexander. And this man says, my wife's father's name is Alexander. Mm. Well, I mean, how could that be? How could that be? So he took, went back to see Alexander. And I think on the wall there, you'll be able to see there are some pictures of Alexander. And he's telling my brother how he helped to save us. And he's telling this Monis what happened to his family. Well, Harold calls me in the middle of the night and wakes us up. He says, I found Alexander. <laughs> well, I, I mean, we were like with tears. Couldn't believe it. But he came home. And I had a neighbor across the street from me who was a Russian piano teacher. And I said to her, we're going, we're going to the bank. We have to write a letter. And uh, write, I wrote out a check. And we're going to send this man money. I mean, here I, he saved us, literally saved us. So we did. She transposed a letter. And we sent it out. And months went by. Months, months, and months went by. And they never got it. So while I was in Florida, this friend of mine says that my husband is going to Belarusia. And I said, I can't believe that. I said, I have to, he has to do me a favor. He has to take money to this man for me. And so he, I called him, and he says, absolutely, I will be happy to take Spike Foreman. I don't know if anyone, but anyway, he, he said, I will take whatever you want to send, but it cannot be in big bills. It has to be in 20s. And he said, I will take it to him. He was going to Minsk. So I went to the bank, and I got lots of 20s. And I wrote a letter to this Alexander, but I made the same wad of money out to this Monis. And I put a picture of Monis on the one, and I put a picture of this Alexander on the other one, which I had from my brother. Mm -hmm. And it went to, uh, he, he took it, and this Monis drove to Minsk and got the money, met them in the hotel, and took the money back to Alexander. Mm -hmm. And Alexander wrote, I said to him, in order for me to know that you received the money, please write and tell me a little something about my father. Mm -hmm. And I think the letter on the wall as well, it's transposed from Polish into 
English, so it may not be exactly the way it, it, it sounds. Uh, but that's, that was Alexander. Mm. Linda, could you share your own experiences of returning to Poland? That's, an, that's, that's another story altogether. Uh, when my granddaughter, Allie, was bat mitzvah, I didn't want her to stop her education. I wanted her to continue. And so I told her that if she continues her education, I will go with her on the March of the Living, which is only when you're a senior. And she was all excited, and she said she's going to go. Now, I'm telling this to my other grandchildren. And at the time, my granddaughter, Lauren, was just going to be a senior. And she said, Nanny, I want to go too. I said, are you sure? Because if you want to go, I will make it happen. And sure enough, she absolutely wanted to go. And she and I went back this past uh, March. No, past April. Past April, because I was there May 1st. I was in, still in Poland. And I can't describe what that trip was. It was, it, it, it was, hmm. it, indescribable. I just don't know. It was my first time back there. When I saw it from the bus, when I saw the woods, I couldn't believe it. There are those woods, those dense woods. It was just unbelievable. It was very tiring. I mean, we were up like 24 hours at a time, not once, but more than once. You started, when you got off the plane, you directly went to Treblinka, and then to Auschwitz. And then there was the march, and the march was unbelievable, unbelievable. To see 10,000, 10,000 youths marching with the flags draped around them, all in blue. It was as far as you could see, as far as you could see. And one of the boys wrote a poem, Why He Marched. That's also on the wall, if you have time to look at it. It's very worthwhile. Uh, after that, we went to Israel, and that was the complete opposite. I just want to say a little something about uh, when, when we were being prepared to go to Israel, we were in our classrooms, and I remember sitting in the classroom in 1947 and someone coming, opening the door, and they said they just voted in the UN that Israel is going to become a state. It passed. And with that, they gave us, everyone screamed, they gave us little blue and white flags and we all went outside and we marched around the building with a little flag singing Israeli song. It, it was just one thing that I neglected to tell you. There were a lot of things that I neglected to tell you, but this just came to my mind because the day we got to Israel, that morning, the first place we went to was the, the, in Tel Aviv, in the house where they declared Israel a state. And walking out from the, from the room, I told all the kids where I was when this happened. And it meant a lot to those, to the children. They all wanted to hear my story, and it wasn't just, it wasn't just our group because each group had a survivor. Each 80 people had a survivor with them. So far, they managed to find them. 
Another five years, I don't know if there will be many left. When I spoke, all the groups wanted to hear, including the survivors, they wanted to hear my story because most of them survived from the concentration camps, which was, this is a little bit different than, than theirs, but they wanted to hear what I had, and, and I felt like I was a celebrity amongst them. The kids were so, they were like sponges. Mm -hmm. They wanted to know about everything. They wanted to hold my hand. They wanted to sit with me. They wanted to have Shabbat with me. They, they just, they, they were so wonderful. I, I can't tell you. The note that I got from one of the parents that afterwards she said, I, I'm just just getting back to myself, he says, and I can imagine how you are. The, uh, it, took, it took a couple, couple weeks before I could, I was just exhausted. But he says, the reward that you must have had from all the, the, from all the children, from all that they received from you, had to have helped you. And it was true, it did, it did. Anything else? I think one more question and then conclude. What was life like in the DP camp and how accepted were you in the surrounding countryside? You, you did relate one incident. Was there much interaction with the surrounding The, the DP camp, she wanted to know how life was in the DP camp. In the DP camp, it was run by American soldiers. It's best to describe is, I remember receiving a care package. Do you remember sending care packages to the soldiers? We each received a care package. It had a toothbrush, it had a cake of soap, it had a Hershey chocolate bar. Uh, I, those are some of the things that I remember that they had them. They started us all in school. Uh, they, all, we all learned how to speak Hebrew. It was every day was, that was our life. I learned how to speak Polish from a family that lived downstairs from us because they spoke no Yiddish. In our house, we spoke Yiddish only. My parents spoke Russian, my parents spoke Polish. Bela, Belarus is a different language. It's, very similar, but it's still a different language. Uh, we had our tests, like my father used to go to Munich every day and he would handle on the black market for our, and buy us clothes and bring them back to us. That's, that's how we dressed. It was being prepared to go to Israel. In the summertime, we would go to, to a camp they called it a moshaba. We lived in a tent with um, um, army cots. That was wonderful. You were out in the open, you were, that was life in, in, in the DP camp. Everybody learned from one another. Everybody had a story. You heard everybody's stories that imaginable in the DP camp. After we left the DP camp, and once I got to America, I, I no longer spoke about my past. It's not that I didn't want to admit to it. It's not, I, I don't, I wanted to go forward. I wanted, I wanted to be American like everybody else. It is only in the past few years that I'm talking about it because I feel that there aren't many of us left. Any time anyone else could talk about it, I let them. But I have to now, and especially after coming back from the trip, not too many of us left. I think on that note, we want to thank you for sharing.